This interview is a joint production between the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project and WKTV Voices. Uh, we are talking today with Sarah Anderson, a Marine Corps veteran who lives in Grand Haven, Michigan, and the interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Okay, so uh, Sarah, begin with some background on yourself, and to start with, where and when were you born? Um, I was born in Muskegon, Michigan. Um, I in 19... I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm a little okay. nervous though. That's okay. <laughs> All right. Um, I was born in Muskegon, Michigan. I was born and raised in on the west side of Michigan, um, okay. 1990. Okay. All right. And what was your family doing for a living when you were growing up? Uh, my dad is a mechanical engineer. My mom was a stay-at-home mom. Um, I have an older brother, a little sister, and a little brother. So we kind of I'll just kind of grew up, I grew up in the same house I did for like 18 years of my life and stayed on in the same spot. Okay, Michigan. all right. Uh, and then when did you graduate from high school? I graduated um, from Freedom Baptist High School in 2009 and that school's in Hudsonville. It no longer exists right now, but. <laughs> okay, yeah. all right. So you went there and then what did you do after high school? I immediately joined the Marine Corps. All right, now what motivated that? So uh, in high school, I was an athlete, um, and I was not a bad student, but I did not like sitting around and just, I needed to expend energy somehow, and so I, I my outlet was sports. Mm -hmm. um, and the thought of going to college immediately for me, I was a restless spirit, so that kind of wasn't really like as exciting to me as it was for a lot of my peers at the time. Um, my brother joined the Marine Corps in 2007, and when I was a sophomore in high school, I attended his graduation up from boot camp from Marine Corps recruiting station, like Marine Corps yeah. Recruit yeah. Depot. There we go. <laughs> Marine Corps Recruit Depot San Diego. And um, I just saw like the, the transformation in him. He was not a very good student. And then he just had was filled with all this pride at what he had accomplished. And um, the Marine Corps just seemed like very attractive to me at that time. It was just a, an outlet of just doing something, fulfilling a purpose or a mission or a duty. And I just, I don't know, I just wanted that confidence. I envied it. And when it was my time to decide, I talked to the recruiter and decided that that's the challenge I wanted to take on. Okay. Uh, now, before we continue with the story, there was one thing, other component I wanted to add up, add in there. Um, you were old enough to remember 9-11. Yes. And do you remember where you were and what happened that day? Um, September 11, 2001, I was in fifth grade, um, just came in from recess, and I remember my teacher just had this like really sad look on her face, and um, she turned on the radio, and she said, I need you all to sit down and be quiet, and a bunch of rowdy kids were like, Some we knew something was serious going on, and we just listened. I didn't even know what the World Trade Center was, like, mm -hmm. I didn't know anything about New York other than, you know, Empire State Building and Lady Liberty, Statue of Liberty. Um, so, I learned real quick what the World Trade Center was, the Twin Towers, and um, I didn't know exactly, it was just the radio, so I didn't see any picture, but they let us off of school early, all our parents came to pick us up, came home and just saw the news, um, and I saw the towers fall on TV. All right, um, and was kind of awareness of that, I mean, does that in any way kind of shape your later decision to go in the service, or was your decision really just a personal one? I think it shaped my decision for sure. Um, it was a personal one, but the um, momentum of the patriotism, I think, that I experienced as a child, um, like uh, America's one of those unique countries that like is very patriotic, very proud of where we come from. And I mean, our country has its issues, but overall there is a unifying aspect of being an American. Um, and around September 11 timeframe, that even more so, um, we were all unified in our grief and in our um, passion to, you know, stay together and be strong. So that impacted me as a child. And when I saw my brother graduate um, from boot camp, I kind of like reaffirmed me and my personal decision too. Is like this will be good for me, and you know, I really want to see like all different sides of America, and including the military. And the challenge really attracted me too. Like. They, the other branches, the Marine Corps said, hey, we were the hardest one. If you can hack it, you can do it. And I'm like, I'm going to hack it. I can do it. And it was just a really fun challenge to take on. All right. Now, when you were talking to the Marine Corps recruiter then, um, did you have any opportunity to, to choose types of training to get? Or were they offering you any particular programs? Or was it just go in and, and, and see where we put you? Um, 
so I did get to choose my MOS, which is a military occupational specialty, like my job mm -hmm. in the military. Um, so males and females in the Marine Corps, they get trained equally, trained the same. There's there's different standards sometimes when it comes to PT, like run times, but every PT is the same and every training is the same. Um, there is no difference. And so when, when you join the Marine Corps, you're a Marine first. Um, and then you become your job as well. Um, so boot camp, the boot camp was entirely like just breaking you down and training you to be a Marine. Okay. Uh, well, what, what MOS did you choose? I chose to be a public affairs specialist. Um, at the time it was called combat correspondent public affairs specialist. Now it is strategic communications and mass communicator. Um, like a lot of my MOS has changed a little bit since I've um, left. I guess we've combined the combat camera and public affairs into the same MOS, so everyone's cross-training and they're doing some awesome stuff right now. But All right, so let's go back to boot camp. Uh, so where do you go for boot camp? I went to Paris Island, South Carolina. Um, that is the only place females are, well, as of now, are permitted to go um, to boot camp mostly because there aren't a lot of females who take up that challenge. So mm -hmm. the um, financially, that's just like the best place to go. It's, Definitely right. not a discriminatory thing, okay. I want to uh, state. There that. are only two bases that, that, mm -hmm. that train uh, Marines at all, so it's one or the other, and so they took Paris Island. Okay. Uh, now, what time of year do you arrive there? I arrived um, in August 2009, so it was just the tail end of the summer, and it was hot, and it was, I just remember feeling like I was going to die. I've never felt anything that hot before. Um, just a swampy blistering heat it was awful and then when I graduated in November it was snowing so okay. we did the crucible in the snow <laughs> it was right. the weirdest time of the year to go <laughs> okay now what sort of reception do you get when you arrive at boot camp <laughs> the reception to boot camp um, it is not an easy one it is the first experience you have with a drill instructor um, you pull up at night um, or at least I pulled up at night on a bus and a drill instructor comes in, shouts at you, tells you what exactly to do, follow exactly, exactly everything they say to the letter and you rush out, step on some yellow footprints, get yelled at some more um, about like how to enter the hatches, how to get started in boot camp and um, then you go from there. How to enter the hatches. Uh, so, or like how to, like what hatches to enter if you will. Um, we, there's this, a sign in Paris Island above the doors that say, um, this is really inspirational quote that's not coming to mind right now, I can look it up, but it's like through these hatches are um, those who tr train to be the most America's okay. fighting force or something. Sorry, I totally slaughtered that. <laughs> well, that's a, but a hatch is like a door, right? So um, the Marine Corps uses Navy terms yes. because we're a department of the Navy. So yeah, yeah. Um, yeah through we use hatches or door, portholes, windows, um, deck is the floor. And in boot camp, it's like we have to be taught a new language. Um, and these drill instructors are even more frustrated because they just passed an entire um, cycle of Marines that just graduated boot camp who were you know, ready to be Marines going back to people you have to be taught. This is a deck, <laughs> this is a hatch. And it was just um, kind of, I'm sure it was entertaining for them or infuriating, I don't know, but. <laughs> Okay. Now, when, your group, when you come in on the bus, was the bus load all, all women, or was it a mix of men and women? The bus load was a mix of men and women. Okay. So that initial thing, they're just bringing you all in. And then did they separate you out into different companies with women training separately from men, or how do they arrange that? For processing, um, we're kind of mixed because, okay. you know, we're just getting all separated, like phone calls home and everything. But then they eventually, like, separate us, males and females. Um, yeah, that's just part okay. of it. All right. And then sort of what's kind of the sequence of events in boot camp? What are you doing first? What do you do later? At the time, there's three cycles. Um, now I believe there's four. Um, but at the time, there's three cycles. And in cycle number one is um, just kind of processing, getting your uniforms, getting your, your boots, um, learning how to do basic things like make a rack and fold a towel and be comfortable um, being around. I wasn't a uh, squad bay with 80 women. A squad bay is uh, a big room full of bunk beds. Mm -hmm. Like, no privacy whatsoever. Um, our bathroom doors were sawed off. We weren't allowed to have that even that kind of privacy. So um, we had three round rounded shower heads to share between 80 women. And we only had like about a minute each to shower all at once. So we had to figure it out. And 
Um, so it was just kind of getting comfortable. I'd never touched a weapon before. We got issued rifles, and I'm like, what is this? <laughs> yeah. Um, I yeah, I never didn't grow up with guns or weapons or anything. So, um, just kind of learning how to do my hair. Um, Marine Corps has pretty strict hair standards when it comes to pulling your hair back in a bun, no flyaways. Um, mm -hmm. Learning the language, learning the basic rules, learning even the basic core values and everything. It's just kind of what you do in the first phase. Um, learning how to march, like it's not like simple, like like you think marching in the movies. It's like in sync. It's in sync motion with your squad and your team. So, um, second phase is um, honing more combat skills and rifle range. So you know, like learn how to shoot. Um, you learn how to move together as a team, um, more drilling, obviously, learn how to march even better, <laughs> and um, learn, yeah, learn how to patrol and just kind of basic, basic combat um, maneuvers. Do you get hand-to-hand -hand combat stuff too? We do. Um, we get something we call MCMAP, it's Marine Corps Martial Arts Program. Um, it's affectionately known called McNinja. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah, just basic self-defense techniques. Um, basics on how to punch, how to um, block, how to maneuver, um, and in boot camp you just get the basic level. Through your Marine Corps career you can progress in, um, the, we have belt system like a lot of martial arts programs do, um, but it's tan belt in boot camp and just basic leg sweeps and stuff like mm -hmm. that. So how, to, how to knock down someone who's bigger than you are? Yeah, so. absolutely. Um, and Which actually was kind of nice because I was a small 18 year old female at the time so it was just nice to know how to do small joint manipulation or um, basic self-defense it was never inter I was never introduced to anything combat related mm -hmm. so um, that was second phase um, and then third phase we continue all of that into a culminating event um, we learn pugil sticks we continue McMap um, we should be nearly experts at drill at this point when it comes like marching and formations and stuff so we do that competition we do um you know uh what else do we do well basically it's just honing those skills um more physical training pt and to um a company event which is called the crucible which is an event where we i believe we did um, a nine mile hike it was three days of um, kind of surviving as a team, doing team building activities and exercises and um, combat techniques like crawling under barbed wire and running up range and shooting and like it just it was just a lot of culminating things that we just learned the entire time there, um, the entire 13 weeks really. Mm -hmm. um, so it was an exhausting three days and we were given a limited number of um, MREs, which are like military rations, um, to kind of like, so we could teach ourselves how to like um, pace ourselves when it comes to, if you have this much food, like this is how you survive off of this much. You don't eat it all at once or you're going to starve kind of thing. At the very end, um, we're all beaten, exhausted, dirty, and tired, and we're all marching back um, together and we're all like singing and singing and um, chanting cadence and getting motivated because at the very end, we just line up barely standing because we're exhausted to be given our eagle of an anchor which signifies you've earned the title marine okay now i was going to go, go back to the beginning of things in this first first few weeks how easy or hard was it for you to adjust to life in the marine corps everyone adjusts differently um and i think basically it depends on personality and how you grew up um i've seen girls who went to boot camp got screamed at and didn't phase them because they've been screamed at all their lives um me, I grew up in um, a very Christian uh, religious Bible Belt of Michigan. It's uh, what it, kind of the reputation is. Um, so it was a very conservative area, um, and I was I was never put down as for being a female or anything. But it was just kind of like a cultural thing that you just get assume that you're going to be a wife and a mom one day, and you don't go and join the military because mm -hmm. that's just not culturally yeah. what we do and not anyone looked down on me I'm not trying to bash my the way I grew up it was it, I grew up very well um, mm -hmm. I was very blessed um, but it was it was a very different thing for m me especially in the Christian school I went to that like women don't what why like kind of thing and um, 
I, when I got to an area where people from all different backgrounds and all different walks of life um, were all in one room getting screamed at by these women that I thought like were demon possessed at the time. I don't know. I was just an ignorant 18 year old. I thought it was the hardest thing at the time that I had ever been through. And mentally I had to adjust and emotionally I had to adjust and it was just, um, I didn't really know what I was getting into. At first it was difficult, but then there's just something in you that clicks that is like, I can do this. Mm -hmm. Like I want this. If you want it bad enough, you're going to complete it. You're going to overcome it. And I think that's, accredited I think to some of my drill instructors to um, not only like beat like discipline in me but um, like that confidence as well and um, at the time I hated everything about them but you know I there is one drill instructor in particular that I modeled my entire leadership style after the next eight years of my life. Okay. Uh, what was it about how she did things that, that stuck with you? Um, so, this drill instructor, her name was Sergeant Fight. Um, all my drill instructors were sergeants, which is kind of uncommon in the drill field or in a uh, boot camp environment. Um, usually you have staff sergeants or gunnery sergeants, like higher ranking, but right. my drill team was all sergeants. And um, Sergeant Fight, she was, she was very, like, just the way she carried herself. Um, she was our senior drill instructor, so she, her role in, on the drill team was to kind of um, be available, be strict and be disciplinarian, but um, be also available for us. Um, because, you know, if something is wrong and we're too afraid to tell the drill instructor, somebody needs to know. And like mm -hmm. she, so she pr made herself in her leadership role that was available to us. Um, there was one time, like, she, I don't know, just the... The confidence she had in herself and the way she carried herself was really inspiring to me. There was one time um, a male drill instructor, um, in assault, ugh, a male drill instructor insulted um, one of our recruits on the rifle range because we trained with the guys during that mm -hmm. week. Um, and our senior drill instructor, Sergeant Fight, found out about it. And I don't think her intention was to shame him in front of everyone, but she did it in a way that was a no BS mentality. Um, it was an example to all the girls, all 80 women in my platoon to not take that just because, um, like it doesn't matter what rank, doesn't matter what status you are, who you are. You like you, you have the confidence you earn, you're earning this, you're working on it. You don't get to take that. And, she stood up for us, but also per made herself an example of how to stand up for yourself and like, do not like, don't, don't take that basically. And come to find out the next eight years of my life, I dealt with that a lot. And it just, I don't know. I really appreciated her example. And when I became a Sergeant, um, I wanted to treat my junior Marines in a way that was, um, fair, inspirational and in a way that could build their confidence. Now, when you went, did your brother tell you anything about what to expect in boot camp? <laughs> um, I don't know if I really want this part on here, but uh, me and my brother don't really get along that okay. well. well. So, like, we have a relationship, mm -hmm. if you will, but he didn't really kind of prepare me very okay. well. Um, that was the, ba the basic question. So it wasn't like they're going to do X, Y, and Z, and this is why they're doing it. Yeah, so my brother was a relatively new Marine when I enlisted, so... Mm -hmm he was still trying to find his feet in the Marine Corps. Right. Um, so I didn't really understand a lot other than they might yell at me or okay. not might, they will yell at me, but, um, I didn't realize what exactly was going to happen. And, um, so when I enlisted, my recruiter didn't really know much about the roles female Marines play. Mm -hmm. Um, I just assumed they were going to be equally treated, which they were, <laughs> they, uh, they, um, same, PT schedule standards, same training and everything. But, um, I mean, we had a little difference when it comes to standards, like when it comes to, uh, PT mm -hmm. fitness tests, if right. you will. Um, but he didn't really know much at all. So okay. I had to figure a lot of it out by myself. All right. So, so, no, uh, okay. Now, uh, were there other women you were training with who in the end couldn't take it? Yes. Okay. But 
what proportion do you think? I think I graduated with 40. That was out of 80. Yeah. Now, were some of those people going to be recycling and coming through again? S some were hurt. Um, some, some women dropped out of boot camp because they were injured. Mm -hmm. um, or they were recycled to another platoon because they were injured and needed to recover. Right. Um, that, um, that, that's very common. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not saying they failed or couldn't hack it. Just right. Oh, yeah. No, it, it happens to men, too. But yeah. yeah. Um, but a lot of women just got there and realized this is not for me. And those women were weeded out real quick. You will not survive boot camp unless you want to survive boot camp. Mm -hmm. And the fastest way out of boot camp with an honorable dis or um, the fastest way out of boot camp is to get through it. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, was there a point in boot camp when you figured out what it was that they were doing or did that only really occur to you after you were done? Um, it kind of, uh, it occurred to me after I was done how effective the training was or what the training actually did to me. Um, at the time, like, I, I, I knew that, oh, they're trying to discipline us and stuff, but it was just, uh, it was just, like, a different environment than I was used to, so I didn't really mm -hmm. comprehend, like, what was going on um, and how the training was breaking me down and building me back up. Okay. Now, physically, were you in good enough shape to handle all the stuff they had you do? Physically, I, yes. Um, I was an athlete in high mm -hmm. school, so I just transitioned right into it. I, it was not... Uh, so I've never been a phenomenal runner, but I can run. Mm -hmm. And um, I can do push-ups. And, you know, and at the time, I was really nervous because, you know, it's the Marine Corps. and But they make the training in a way that starts you from the beginning mm -hmm. so not everyone was where I was physically because I was an athlete not everyone was an athlete so they keep that in mind they start everyone off at the same level um, so yeah while I was nervous like I had other reasons to be nervous other than physical training but they they are realistic about training mm -hmm. in okay. my opinion or were at the time <laughs> all right anything else about those first 13 weeks that kind of stands out in your memory um, There doesn't have to be. I, th there, there are a few, I guess. It's just, it was just a long time ago. So, um, so there was this one time on the rifle range, and speaking about women getting weeded out, um, there was this one time on the rifle range that uh, there was this girl who intentionally kept missing because she wanted out of boot camp, and she didn't like it, and she made it through first phase. And I remember thinking it might have been be, me being naive, but I'm like, well, why would you sign up? And I, why, why don't you want this? I want this. Like, this is just a foreign concept to me. Mm -hmm. And, um, but yeah, if the girls who wanted out found a way, um, and, but I, I didn't, I wanted to complete it. And like, th there's no challenge that I've ever not really given my whole heart into whether I completed it or not. Um, but I, I was not gonna not complete boot camp. Um, and I think receiving the Eagle Love and Anchor at the end was one of the proudest moments of my life, if not the proudest. And it sets the tone for every Marine going into the Marine Corps. Um, every Marine receives an Eagle Love and Anchor. Everyone gets it pressed into their palm. And everyone remembers um, that what that feeling is like. And that kind of unifies us um, throughout like our service um, and whenever a marine starts kind of losing their way another marine can be like hey do you remember that feeling do you remember what it was like this is why we act the way we act this is why we hold honor courage and commitment in our hearts it's because of that moment because we all felt it and mm -hmm. we all felt that pride and so you got to do your duty the way that you're expected to the way you committed to and um, yeah it's just kind of a unifying thing Okay. Now, once you complete those 13 weeks, do you now go to a school for your MOS, or is there any additional training that everyone gets before that? So in the Marine Corps, after uh, boot camp, we go to um, Marine Combat Training, um, or for infantry guys, they go to Infantry uh, ITB, Inter Infantry Training Battalion. Mm -hmm. um, so as at the time, females weren't allowed in the infantry, so all females went to Marine Combat Training. Um, and it wasn't just female exclusive. Um, it was every Marine that was not signed up to be an infantryman. Okay. So that's the only separation. Um, every Marine needs combat training. Um, 
infantry marines go to infantry training battalion because that's doubles as their um, job school right and we just get the basic month of down and dirty this is how we do things this is how you patrol this is how you guard a tower this is how you use a radio this is how you treat um you know medical like any this various medical um like uh, well, injuries injuries, injuries yes. yeah um and so it was like down and dirty a a lot of information packed into that month. Okay, and where did you do that? Uh, North Carolina, Camp Johnson. Okay, is that part of Camp Lejeune? It is within Camp Lejeune, yes. Okay. All right, uh, you, you, got a, you got that for a month, and uh, how did that go for you? Uh, it was interesting, it was my first time working with males, um, and it, I mean, it felt, I don't know, it, it, I mean, it's a tough month, they're hard on you. Um, like, but I was kind of like expecting that because boot camp was hard on us too. <laughs> so um, after boot camp, you get ten days leave, and then you go to Marine combat training, and you uh, learn more in depth about uh, rifle training, about patrolling, about basic combat techniques that expounded upon what you learned in boot camp. Um, and yeah, that's okay, that's all I remember. <laughs> all right, so you kind of get that. So you got that, and then then where do you go next? After Marine combat training, um, you go to your MOS school mm -hmm. or your military occupational specialty right. school. I signed up for public affairs, so I went to Fort Meade, Maryland. It's a joint base. Um, it was an army base, but mm -hmm. it was joint schooling. So I went to um, <laughs> I went to school with every service: um, uh, Navy, Air Force, Army, Coast Guard, <laughs> even. So um, did I forget one? Um. Well, no, because you our Army, Navy, Air Force, yeah, yeah the uh, Air Force, Marines, <laughs> like Coast Guard. Yes, that's all. Okay. Uh, now, how was that experience different from your Marine Corps training? It was different because um, every branch is a different culture, um, and I remember being really motivated and really um, excited about being a Marine, and you know, just a little nineteen-year-old me, and. Um, so there was a lot of, you know, trash talking between like all services because we were all brand new and we all wanted to be like, yeah, we're the best kind of thing. And that's just, that's just how it was. And it was my first experience with that. And it was actually really fun getting to know other services. It wasn't just trash talk. We actually mm -hmm. built relationships and we learned things about other services and other people our age who made different decisions and what services they made. And it was, it was a good experience. Um, the schooling itself taught journalism. Um, it was three months was three five months but mm -hmm. I think I was there for five months but the school was three they taught us basic photography basic journalism how to write stories um, how to interview people how to record people for video interviews so it's down and dirty journalism mm -hmm. multimedia journalism mm -hmm. and that's what it was and after I completed school they gave me orders to the Marine Corps Combat Center, Twin Island Palms. Okay. Now, at the school itself, I mean, did that work basically like a nine to five job as opposed to uh, kind of other sorts of training that you had, or were they still waking you up in the middle of the night? Or was, was there still a military training aspect to the school, or was it now more professional? The school definitely was a more professional environment, but there was still military training. We woke up super early to go run together or go PT together. Um, we, the Marines all were in one. Um, barracks type building um, we each got our own rooms or we shared rooms with people but we it wasn't a squad based setting mm -hmm. anymore um, but uh, yeah and we all woke up together we all PT'd um, showered up went to school together till five in the evening and then we had the evenings off okay and what proportion of that group was female um, so in my MOS, it was probably about 50-50. Mm -hmm. um, my MOS is pretty pretty mixed gender, and, right. and the di diversity is pretty um, good. Um, the Marine Corps overall, when I was in, only 6% of the Marine Corps was female. Mm -hmm. So that is rare to okay. see a 50-50 mix between female and male. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so now you head off uh, to your first base and it's in 29 Palms, California. Uh, describe that place a little bit. So the Marine Corps Air Ground Combat Center, 29 Palms, California. Um, well, from a Michigan girl, um, never really left Michigan other than the occasional family vacation. Um, I'd never been to the desert before. Um, and I heard stories, I heard stories that it was like 
the like the worst base to go to and um no marine wants to get stationed in 29 palms and i was like oh no i was like freaking out <laughs> I, like i my first duty station 29 palms well um i kind of learned to embrace the desert um the desert of california is beautiful and if you go in there with a the mindset of oh, I'm going to have a terrible time. You're going to have a terrible time. Um, and I kind of learned that. It took me a few months to adjust because um, I wasn't used to anything other than East Coast. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, what really kind of on my personal time attracted me to that area was Joshua Tree National Park. Mm -hmm. I love climbing and hiking and um, it was just beautiful. The desert flowers in the spring. It's just, it was, it was a really great community. The actual base um, where I worked, there's some really great people. Um, people who love the area and love the Marine Corps just kind of stick around and you kind of get to know the culture of the base itself even though Marines are always transitioning in and out mm -hmm. the culture of the area um, it's really a family type environment um, the combat center was very fast-paced we had battalions it's it, so the combat center is really fast-paced we had uh, it, it was a transition base so before units went to Afghanistan or Iraq, they would have to train in 29 Palms. They would have to get desert warfare trainings. Mm -hmm. um, so we had battalions coming through all the time. It was like very fast. We had deployments leaving and coming and buses leaving and coming full of Marines all the time. And um, I was a journalist. So I was a photographer of our station at headquarters battalion. So I wasn't allowed to deploy with them. And I think my biggest frustration was building relationships with these guys, spending time with them in the field, taking their picture, interviewing them, um, and watching them leave on buses, and watching most of them come home seven months later, and not all of them. And that was as a Marine who wanted to be there um, to document um, their stories and stuff. It was, it was frustrating that I couldn't go with them. Okay. Um, and then sort of what kind of group were you working with? I mean, was there a certain set of people you were normally with and how large was it or how many people were you? You station in my section? Yeah. Um, so in headquarters Italian, it's kind of like, I, I used to say, it's kind of like the misfits of um, th that run the base. Uh, mm -hmm. We have, it's a unique battalion because there's sections of people all in one battalion. And we have the supply section, we have the transportation section. We have motor to you, we have the admin section, we have the journalists, like that was us, there was combat camera, there's just all like the, all a bunch of sections making up one battalion. So whereas normal battalions kind of interact all day or, or a lot and they get to know each other and what companies and stuff, we were so separated and we only got together during unit PTs or um, special events. We tried, but mm -hmm. I mean... So each section became very close. Okay. And um, I had probably eight or nine Marines in mine, um, maybe ten at some times. Um, and we worked at the base newspaper um, at the time, before the base newspaper disappeared. Mm -hmm. So every week we had to um, tell stories about what's going on in the base and um, take pictures of Marines in the training. So since there was so much transition of battalions coming in before Afghanistan, I would take a lot of, like, I'd go out to the field a lot with them and just kind of document them before they head out and kind of um, tell the story about the training that they're being prepared for before they go over there. <coughs> but, um, yeah, so it was it was cool. I got to know a lot of people in my own battalion only because my job required so many stories mm -hmm. to be put in the newspaper that I went out and, like, actively sought them out. All right. Uh, and when you're you want to interview people and, and so forth. Uh, what kind of responses did you get? Um, so <laughs> Marines are typically pretty private people. Um, or not, they don't, I don't know. It, some, some Marines are really helpful. Um, and some were like, I don't want to be in the media. Mm -hmm. Um, it was kind of frustrating at times because I understood that like, absolutely. We don't join the military for recognition or, mm -hmm fame or to have our face out there um but as they got to know me and like kind of trusted that I can do my job well mm -hmm. and will make them look good basically or um will support them um a lot of the pictures and videos I took were for the families and mm -hmm. were for um people back home it wasn't necessarily for that marine it was to tell their story mm -hmm. 
Um, and while some of them didn't want their story being told, it was important to tell their story. And that's kind of the, uh, the angle I took it from, and they kind of understood that. So, yeah, I understood I, that some of them didn't want their faces mm-hmm. out there, but, you know, I had to do my job, so okay. <laughs> I figured it out. All right, and you kind of learned, in a way, sort of how to talk to them or approach them. Did you get a sense of how they're going to respond as you're kind of, or how to deal with people of different personalities and feel Absol- that out? You know, actually being a Marine Corps journalist instead of just a journalist coming on a base um, really helped because we had that bond already or Mm -hmm. that um, mutual understanding of what being a Marine is. Um, And so, like, no one was outright disrespectful, at least not to my face, um, about not wanting their, you know, their presence out there because, like, we were both Marines. There was, like, that mutual respect there. Um, So... As a journalist coming in, not a lot of them, or yeah, most of them who've never been in the military don't know what the standards are, how you conduct yourself professionally, mm-hmm. how um, we hold each other accountable, and you know what being a Marine actually means. So, okay. all right. Uh, now, would units coming back from uh, Afghanistan or Iraq, if there were any at that point, uh, do they go back through Twenty Nine Palms or? Um, not every one of them. So, mm-hmm. say a unit deploys out of Camp Lejeune. So they, they go to Twenty Nine Palms to train, go back to Camp Lejeune and then deploy from there. Mm-hmm. Um, but we had infantry battalions at Twenty Nine Palms that were stationed there. Right. So they did go to the sandbox <laughs> as they called it. They'd go um, to Iraq or Afghanistan and they'd come back and just stay in Twenty Nine Palms because that's where they lived. Okay. And then did you interview some of them after they're back or was that not part of your job? Um, I did. I think most of the stories that were impactful were off the record though mm-hmm. because of those relationships built yeah so I, I wouldn't say that I wrote a lot of stories about um, you know the their personal experiences other than um, the ones that kind of like hey like this is what we did this is yeah. um, just letting you know like this is what the Marines are this is how the Marines are doing awesome things and just keeping you informed but like when it came to real like down and dirty stuff um, it was more important to me to build relationships and be there, f- be available for those people to mm-hmm. like talk in a trusting environment without being like fear of on the record. Okay. Now, on some level, is that kind of part of what your job is, or was that just some way that you dealt with things yourself? Um, I think it's just being a Marine. Um, you know, there's like kind of a joke between all the branches that the Marines are the brainwashed ones and. You know, the Marines are like a cult or, you know, it's probably true. I don't know. We just have like a special understanding of what it's like to be a Marine. And um, we just have a lot of pride in who we are. And mm-hmm. I mean, every service is respectable and um, you, you're giving up your time and you're serving your country and stuff. Um, but, you know, as a Marine, I'm a little biased because like we have that understanding and mm-hmm. it's it's funny to you know, trash talk each other sometimes. Like, I got some really good Air Force friends that just, <laughs> that mess with me all the time, and I'm just like, hey, you know, whatever, you right, we are a cult. <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, now, how long were you based at 29 Palms? I was in 29 Palms from 09 to 13, and then I was transferred to Marine Corps Base Hawaii, Kaneohe Bay, um, in 2013, and then I stayed on island till 2016, but I transferred to Camp Smith while on island which is another base on island. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, now so you've got basically four years uh, at 29 Palms. Uh, did your job change over that time or were there things about the environment that changed at all? In 29 Palms, no. Um, I worked in a newspaper the entire time. Um, I mean, so they still had a newspaper by the time you left? Yeah. And then when I transferred to Marine Corps Base Hawaii, they were just like on the tail end of their newspaper. So I kind of started working at their newspaper for a year. Um, but then there became a huge social media focus. Um, it was, in my job field, it's different because um, communication overall changes and grows and develops. I mean, when I was a kid, I had a, like, we didn't have cell phones. And mm-hmm. then I had my first flip phone. Um, when I got my license, but like barely, it was prepaid minutes. And now like I see, you know, nine year olds having iPhones. And it's just, it's just crazy how technology and communication changes over time. So for a very old school environment like the Marine Corps, that mm-hmm. is very stuck in tradition, 
it was really difficult to tear their newspapers away from them and be like, this is not how we communicate anymore. We communicate via social media, through like online presence, through building relationships, having a continual presence. And the Marine Corps actually um, is leading all the branches, I would say, in their social media presence. The, um, their branding is amazing and how they've taken it, but there's still like that old school mentality of a lot of the Marines to just kind of like, we, but we need our newspaper. <laughs> and I'm mm-hmm. like, it's not how people communicate anymore. So it's, it's actually transitioning out. And I have loved that I've gotten to see the Marine Corps grow from one aspect to another. Okay. Now, um, how long was your original enlistment? My original enlistment was four years. Okay. So at a certain point, you decide to re-up then? Yes. To stay in there. Uh, so when did you make that decision? Uh, I was in 29 Palms, and I was on my last year of enlistment. And um, something hit me that I'm not ready to get out. Like, what am I going to do, go to college? Like, <laughs> And I'm obviously not going to college now. There's nothing wrong with going to college. But um, I just I wasn't ready. Um, I was I was disappointed because I worked so hard to be a Marine and I wanted to deploy and I wanted to do all these amazing things and I, as much as I loved 29 Palms or grew to love 29 Palms, I never left it. Mm-hmm. I never did anything that I wanted to do. So I, um, I realized that yeah, I gotta re-enlist because I gotta see what else is out there in the Marine Corps. Like I love the Marine Corps, so maybe they'll deploy me next enlistment. Mm-hmm. But there was a time, um, is, yeah, this is a little more personal, but I don't mind sharing it. Um, so the Marine Corps is attracts very good old boy type mentality, like country boy, traditional. Mm-hmm. Um, and it very it attracts very progressive women. Mm-hmm. And those two cultures don't mix very well. So a lot, and I'm not, I'm not speaking for all individuals. Mm-hmm. Every individual is different. Um, but I'm just telling you from my experience how... Mm-hmm. I saw things, um, and what I saw was a lot of men very hesitant or still feeling very new that there's female leadership above them, and that was not an easy thing to maneuver through. Um, I never experienced sexism before. Mm-hmm. I never experienced um, a culture where um, sexual assault I wouldn't say they have a rape culture in the military I would say that it's a very real thing um, and they like they do their best to train and inform and educate like I I really think they, they try but um, it's a very real thing and and a culture like that being thrown into a culture like that as a female just from a gender perspective was not easy I felt like I worked twice as hard for half the credit mm-hmm. a lot um, so picking up rank I was proud of myself, but not everybody else was. Um, so having a culture like that, there was, when it came to reenlisting, I was really thinking about getting out because it was kind of exhausting to adjust to that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I had a gunnery sergeant who was, I was a corporal at the time, so I was an E4. Um, he was an E7, a gunnery sergeant. He told me that, you know, Anderson, you single-handedly changed my mind about female Marines. Mm-hmm. You are a good example, and the Corps would be losing a good Marine. Wouldn't it be worth it to re-enlist and change one more mind? Mm-hmm. And I'm like, that's it. I'm re-enlisting. Like, I gotta, like, if uh, that was just, that meant a lot to me um, when he said that. And because, you know, there are stereotypes that are, that are ahead of you as a female Marine, mm-hmm. and or as a few, I'm sure, female in the military in general. I can't speak for any other branch, but um, there's stereotypes that you constantly have to battle, and even if you mm-hmm. never live up to one of them, you still have to battle it just because of how you're born. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when he encouraged me like that and just kind of basically told me that I was breaking glass ceilings without even yeah. knowing it, I was just like, yes, let's do it. Like, I'll re-enlist. And you know what? I actually did. Um, I picked up rank, I gained more confidence, um, I got more leadership roles, and I became an example for, or I, I strove to become an example for other female Marines. Um, There's the best of my ability, at least. Okay. Now, uh, when you re-enlist, do they offer you a chance to, to pick your next station, or at least put in requests, or how do you wind up in Hawaii? Um, so yeah, when you re-enlist the first time, um, you get an incentive, and my incentive was um, a deployable unit in Hawaii. Um, 
so that's how I got Hawaii. They're like, okay, you were in the desert for four years. I'm sure we can get you. We can, you know, pull mm -hmm. some strings and get you a tropical island. So that was nice. Um, but when I got to the unit, it transitioned into a non-deployable unit, or it the option of deployment went away. Okay. And so I was like, man, <laughs> all right, we're gonna make the best out of this. But I ended up falling in love with the island of Hawaii, and I did go. I did travel a little bit. Um, but not nearly as much as I wanted okay. to. And that's now, wh which island is the base on? Is that on Oahu or is it on the big island? Or? Yeah, both bases are on Oahu. Okay. Um, actually, every military base is on Oahu. All right. So. Okay. So, yeah, now what was, what was, uh, what were you actually doing on that base? Because you said the newspaper goes away, so then what are you doing? Um, so I, we had a public, public affairs is the military version of public relations mm -hmm. in this equivalent, at least into the civilian world. So we did a lot of media escorts. Um, we did um, talking points, interviews. I still interviewed people. I still wrote stories, but it was more like a social media mm -hmm. aspect. Um, and it, it was just a different focus, different platform we used. Right. So I, my job didn't change. Um, it was just a heavier focus on how do we effectively communicate with people or how do we, what's the best way. And we did a lot of um, media training as well for units to how to use their social media accounts. How do, um, every battalion has like their own Facebook, so mm -hmm. how do you use it? Uh, we, we'll teach you how. So, okay. yeah, that's kind of, we're the communication people. All right. Now, did you have to learn a lot of that stuff yourself, or had you were far were you far enough along with that kind of thing by the time you got there that you could just step into it? Um, a lot of it was experimentation on social media, like do videos work better or do photos work better? And since communication is always changing and evolving, um, it was kind of both self-taught and as a team we learned together. We did a lot of experimenting as a, a unit, like up for like ten people. We um, were just like let's try new things out and. That's what I really appreciated about my MOS is it was a very creative environment. Um, and in a military setting, you don't get a lot of creative environments. And <laughs> that's why I just, I loved my job so much. We got to, I got to meet new people every day and I got to experiment and create um, graphic designs and news articles and it was just, I loved it. It was just a lot of freeing artistically, um, but while still holding the standard of discipline and being a Marine. Okay. And in terms of the kind of content of the stories and stuff that you're doing, how is it different in Hawaii from 29 Palms? Were you talking to different kinds of people or people who had done different things, or did it all seem pretty much the same? So similarly, the bases um, both had infantry battalions, so uh, there was that culture there. But in Hawaii, um, because of its location in the Pacific, we were closer to a lot of different countries um, and we did a lot of exercises that promoted like regional security. Um, we'd work with Australia or Indonesia and um, Japan, Korea. We'd, we'd partner with these nations um, to do training exercises just in case something happens like the earthquake in Nepal when everyone started setting, sending aid. We had to know how those countries functioned. That way we can like build up security in the region. So. Right. Um, we did, I worked, I was so blessed. I worked with like a bunch of different countries and um, learned, you know, how they do their, um, their routines and their ranges. And um, I have made friends from all over the world. It was, it was fun experience. Okay. Uh, what, were there things that you learned that kind of surprised you about these people or these places? You know, one, yeah, a bunch of, I learned okay. a bunch of different things. Um, one thing I did notice um, on a few training exercises is how well some militaries integrated their females and males. Mm -hmm. um, like as a female Marine, that was like my biggest struggle was um, always being out with the guys as the photographer, but usually I was the only female in the field, so a lot of guys didn't know how to handle me. And mm -hmm. um, they eventually warmed up to me after a few days, you know, but like at first it's like, why, why is she here? She's not a, in the infantry at the time. Females weren't allowed in the infantry. Mm -hmm. So um, New Zealand, Canada, and um, Australia in particular, I, I mean, I honestly don't know all the issues with mm -hmm. their services um, that they deal with, but in the training exercises, they just, it just felt like they were so in sync, the females and males. A lot of, like Canada in particular, their um, army, there seemed to be their average demographic or average um, age was a little bit older than ours, mm -hmm. um, like late 20s, early 30s. Um, so there was like a maturity aspect when it came to like integrating males and females. So I just I just like watched them be like, well, if they can do it, we can do it. Why why are we freaking out mm -hmm. that females are going to be allowed in combat roles? 
because they're doing it in these countries already and they're fine you know I just it gave me perspective and I really appreciated um, seeing those different nations and like the, the pluses and minuses on both and how we can improve and how, what, how they're doing things and it was just it was cool okay and did anything stand out to you about say Japanese or Koreans Um, so, uh, Asian, Asian countries, they, that they don't really integrate their females mm -hmm. very well. So when they saw me, a lot of them were just kind of like, <laughs> like <laughs> looking at me like I was a unicorn. And I thought that was funny. I got used to it after a while because we worked so often with other nations. Um, but it was just culturally, like they don't have a lot of women heavily involved in their military. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that, you know, women don't have opportunity in those countries, but um, in their military, it was just kind of weird that, you know, like I was just like a, a different foreign concept to them. And so that was in, that was interesting to kind of, it was, I thought it was funny, and, but it was good. Like I got to know them. I, I'm a very friendly personality, so I wasn't afraid to, you know, try and, mm -hmm. Like, I, I didn't, obviously didn't know the language, but I'm not afraid to look kind of stupid to get to know someone, <laughs> if you will. So the Indonesians were fun. Um, they would teach me some some words, and they just said it was so funny, like, my accent. And mm -hmm. I don't know. It was just, no, it was, it's good. I loved my job for that, to meet all these new people. Okay. And, uh, like, how large was the section you were working with there? I mean, did you have a team and so forth? So... Um, we had, like I said, like a team between like eight and ten Marines in the yeah. public affairs, and then combat camera had like anywhere between like fifteen to thirty, depending on the shop. But when it comes to like video shoots and training, you're by yourself, mm -hmm. um, so you learn how to work by yourself very like quickly, and you have to get all these uh, missions and deadlines done um, while coordinating what you need done with, like for example, an infantry battalion who doesn't need Wi-Fi to upload photos and get them mm -hmm. online. Um, how do you function? Like, how do you meet your deadlines mm -hmm. while being in the middle of the desert or being on a, an island with no connectivity? And so you have to problem solve. So individual um, working and problem solving are like two skills that I really picked up um, working with, like working at my job remotely. Okay, now when you go in the field like that, what kind of equipment did you take with you? So uh, we take your basic stuff like, um, like packs and your food and your you know, all your gear and everything but also like my camera gear and computer were always with me because I needed to get photos like put together video projects put together stories put together and the soonest opportunity I could to upload them I did but I had all that extra gear too okay and the I guess the camera equipment I mean how large a camera were you carrying um so we had DSLRs um which is like a awesome digital camera mm -hmm. that does video and photo so okay. we are past the days of me carrying this giant video yeah, camera yeah. with me so I, it's like the same so like yeah the canon canon um just a normal camera kit that like right. professional photographers carry out now is about the size of the kit i had mm -hmm. okay but that's sort of on top of a lot of a, essentially the regular military kit or at least mm -hmm. if you're carrying your own food water things like that um Plus, now, did you have a laptop computer or a tablet, or what were you using at that point? I had a laptop. Um, okay. Yeah, so y you're right. Um, when it comes to, like, long-distance hikes and stuff, all the, the same, the packs that the guys had to carry, I had to carry that in camera gear. Now, I, I understand every guy had um, a different, like, weapon to carry, too. Like, mm -hmm. infantry guys have machine guns and mortar tubes and, like, a bunch of other stuff, additionally, that I didn't have to carry, but the average standard pack um, we had, and then I had the camera gear as well. All right, so that, that original marine training and so forth comes in handy mm -hmm. at that point, because you're used to go marching around places with a pack and all yeah. of that, that kind of thing. Okay, um, and are there uh, other particular things about that first assignment in Hawaii that kind of stand out for you? Hawaii afforded me a lot more opportunity, I think, than um, 29 Palms. And now, I, like I said, I like that base and mm -hmm. it was fun learning the combat side of things, um, the desert warfare side right. of things, if you will. Um, but Hawaii, um, I don't know, I just, it, it's because there was an air wing there that was more available. I got to fly around more. Um, I got to get on ship in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Like I'd never been on a Navy ship before. 
Um, <laughs> I, you know, the Navy ship was a good experience, but I'm really glad I didn't join the Navy because I get seasick. So <laughs> that's a, that's a real thing. Um, I respect all those, my Navy friends for that one. But, um, I, uh, I got to go to like the big Island and train with like 40 other countries once. Like mm -hmm. that was a massive training exercise. I went to Australia for Marine Rotational Force Darwin. Okay. Um, the, the unit deployment program. Um, I went to, to Australia again for Talisman Sabre. So um, Australia was the really only country that I got to visit, which is like kind of still my um, kind of deepest regret with the military is not being able to, even though it wasn't my fault, but mm -hmm. not being able to travel as much as I wanted to. Right. And you said with the deployments in Australia, you mentioned Darwin. Was that at, at Darwin like the town in the northern part of Australia that you actually went to? Yes. Okay. So what was that like? Darwin. Um, Darwin's like, uh, Dar <laughs> so Darwin is not a like massive city like um, Sydney, mm -hmm. um, and it's kind of a deserty environment, like really hot. Um, mm -hmm. It's not like a desert, but it's just yeah, like the tundra and everything. Um, so we were based in Darwin, but then we'd go on training exercises in. Uh, Bradshaw training area, which is like affectionately known the uh, the outback, mm -hmm. if you will. So, um, we'd go into the middle of the actual desert, and we would run ranges and train. And I mean, it was sleeping underneath the Milky Way in the middle of the outback, seeing the Southern Cross, which is our unit um, at the time, our unit constellation on our logo. Like mm -hmm. that was just, it was just, it was so cool. <laughs> I. Uh, and waking up like super early in the morning for a hike and like all the dust from the desert is like piling up with the sunbeams showing through it was like a photographer's dream like mm -hmm. i had so much fun taking pictures in the outback it was exhausting you got dirty you didn't get to shower very often and mm -hmm. you had to suck it up a lot and you had to carry your own weight but it was an experience like nothing i've ever had were you the only person from your unit that was doing that or did you have a few people that you knew with you so in darren we had um a few people um, but we all each, like, again, like, when training exercise happened, we each, like, went out and did our own thing. Um, and when I actually went um, to train for a month and a half, I believe that extra, that cycle was, mm -hmm. we had four of us with us. Okay. So we could all, like, kind of tag team. You do video, I'll do photo, you write the story kind of thing. So we all just kind of took turns. Okay. And when you went to that deployment, did they fly you out, or did you have to? So you're, so you're not riding a Navy ship with a, a troop transport with everybody the whole way? Some do. I didn't. Okay. Um, I flew. All right. Uh, and then what was the other deployment in Australia then? Because you had... Um, that was a two-week training exercise, mm -hmm. so it wasn't like a deployment. It was okay. called Talisman Sabre. Um, every year there is a partnership with Australia in some way, shape, or form, and they're, every other year they do Talisman Sabre. And... Um, the off years are rim pack, rim of the Pacific mm -hmm. exercise, I believe. Okay. I'm trying to make sure all my information's correct. <laughs> like right. I. So, so kind of what area were you in then for Talisman Darwin. Saber? I was like, okay, you're back at Darwin again. Yeah. Okay. And do they take you back out in the desert again, or do you? Okay. Yep. Um, so that because it was only two weeks, I um, there some training exercises. I went out for a day and came right back because mm -hmm. I needed to get the photos up. Yeah. Um, I went out for two days. Some I went out for a month. So it just depended, or a month or two, it depended on what the demands of that were like. And mm -hmm. I would, you know, when on the longer training exercises, I would have like a, a USB and send it back of photos or whatever mm -hmm. if I couldn't connect. And I, I'd figure it out. Every every place you went, you figured it out. So. All right. And, and so were there uh, vehicles or helicopters going back and forth between the field and the rear so you could either hitch a ride or give something to somebody? Uh, yes, they're usually, so when we go out into the field, there's like this, they set up like a, uh, like a base camp, if mm -hmm. you will, and then you go even further out. So like there's the base camp that you can go to, um, to deliver stuff to, Right. but you're still out there. You're not, I'm not going all the way back to Darwin. That was like a 10 hour drive. Mm -hmm. All right. And some people that hear about Australia, they think about uh, interesting and dangerous fauna. Did you have to worry about scorpions and snakes and things like that? Or was that not an issue? <laughs> I was worried about that, but I, we're in the middle of the desert, like, and there's tall, dry grass, so there was brush fires everywhere, and, and there's wildfires all over that area, and, it, and we kept far enough away for safety mm -hmm. and everything, but um, we were 
so there was like really tall dry grass yeah. because in the the wet season the whole place is covered in swampy mm-hmm. and in the dry it's like a wasteland so there's really tall dry grass that we're walking through uh, for our one of our patrol um, movements and we're just we're supposed to be quiet you know because you know coming up on a hypothetical enemy and I I was just sitting there with my camera walking through this tall grass like kind of low-key panicking that there's going to be these crazy um, poisonous creatures everywhere and I like remember nudging the guy next to me I didn't know who he was I'm like are you worried about like (laughs) snakes and stuff and he just kind of looks at me he's like I don't know and I look over to another guy and he heard us and he's just kind of like shh (laughs) and I'm like okay you know I guess I guess we're just going to accept our doom and continue (laughs) like whatever (laughs) I'm sure somebody thought about it. <laughs> okay. But there weren't any formal warnings about the fauna or anything like that. No. I mean, we saw kangaroos and stuff, but we never encountered anything super dangerous. So. All right. And at least if the kangaroos attack, your people are armed. So. Yeah, exactly. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, so you have... Um, now, you do, when you're in Hawaii, you do switch assignments. You go to a different base. And how did that come about? Um, so when I first got to Hawaii, I spent a year in their uh, a Marine Corps base, Hawaii. Um, but then there were openings at Camp Smith, mm-hmm. um, Marine Corps forces specific. And so we were taking recommendations from, like, cause we, I guess we had too many people at Marine Corps base, Hawaii. So they just transferred me and one other person over. Um, and that was a higher command. That was unlike any other command I'd been in. Um, Marine Corps forces specific was in charge of every Marine Corps, um, unit in that area. Mm-hmm. So I worked two floors below a three-star general. Mm-hmm. Um, I worked two doors down from a full bird colonel, which is one step below a general. Yep. So it was as a sergeant, like who was used to just dealing with people, peers, and a few enlisted ranks mm-hmm. above me. I had to learn real quick how to, um, I, I always felt like I was professional, but I had to learn real quick that how to talk to um, senior leadership within the entire organization of the Marine Corps. And it was a good experience. Um, I think not a lot of Marines get to see a general level and work next to one. And it, it was really fun to kind of learn from like the older generation of Marines and kind of learn leadership styles from what they had experienced, what they are, what I want to be, and just kind of take um, it was a good learning experience. Okay. Now, are the more senior people, uh, were, were they uh, used to dealing with women, or did they handle that professionally, or did you still have the sense that you kind of don't belong here? Oh, with senior leadership, they're way more professional. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, that was not um, not really an issue um, with, like, for the most part. I mean, I can't speak for every female Marine. Mm-hmm. Obviously, there's a bunch of situations, but um, it was kind of refreshing working around people who were like older and like genuinely cared about your development or um, were guiding influences if you needed it. And so. And were there some higher ranking women in that mm-hmm. assignment as well? So you're. Yes. Um, but with that, when it comes to um, female leadership, it's hit and miss. And at the risk of sounding like negative. Oh, and the same with males too. There's not a lot of a bad leadership can ruin your unit. It can mm-hmm. ruin um, your experience. It can ruin your attitude. I mean, if you let it. Mm-hmm. So there's uh, unfortunately there's like a stereotype for female Marines for a reason because mm-hmm. there are people who have bad poor moral character um, or just like people who just are not good at leadership. Um, but when you find that female that is like what you want to be. Mm-hmm. That is someone to like cling to and become a mentee of, okay. for sure. All right. Uh, and was your job now different from what it had been previously? Are you doing a different set of things, or just the same stuff for a different group of people? Um, so I stopped. I stopped being so much of a journalist um, and more of a brand marketer, if you will, um, and focusing heavily on media relations. I learned how to write press releases and talking points for the generals, what mm-hmm. should they be interviewed? Um, media escorts, um, got to work with CNN, Fox, Vice News, um, Reuters. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it, it, it was cool. I got to uh, meet a lot of Pearl Harbor veterans because Pearl Harbor is right down the road right. from Camp Smith. Um, I got to see a lot of 
and appreciate a lot of like the history that I am a part of. And I learned a lot about the Marines' role in the Pacific, uh, the Pacific theater during World War II. Mm-hmm. So. All right. Um, does anybody, I mean, so get, so some of it is your kind of using Marine Corps history to help kind of promote the Marine Corps or are you, are there some of the events going on that you're part of, uh, cause you're at Pearl, you know, in that Pearl Harbor area. Uh, now, do they also pay attention to things that Marines did later, you know, in Vietnam or Korea or, uh, the more recent conflicts? Was that also, did you do things that related to those or was it mostly World War II and, and now? Um, absolutely. Actually, I had a, a combat camera friend go to Vietnam to document um, retrieval of uh, bodies of mm-hmm. Marines that never came home or service members. Right. Um, so, like, it was very the history of the uh, the U.S. presence in that area is very real, and mm-hmm. it's like still a a can like it's it's still a a big part of the history and taken very seriously and respectfully. Mm-hmm. When I was in Hawaii, um, 35 bodies of Marines were excavated from Tarawa, mm-hmm. from World War II, an island of Tarawa. Yeah. Um, Marines still hike Iwo Jima, mm-hmm. like to this day, to put their rank or their emblem on the top to uh, memorialize like the, the Marines that died there. Mm-hmm. The history of the Marine Corps is very important to Marines. Um, it's just who we are. It's it's those who came before us and those who are coming after us. We kind of all see each other in like a bonding way of you were a Marine and this is what you did and mad respect to you because, you know, that's that's kind of what we're all here for. And um, so we're take care of our um, World War II veterans and Vietnam veterans if we get the chance, for right. sure. Okay. Uh, now you basically do two hitches, so you do eight years in, in the Marines. Uh, at what point did you decide you were leaving? Um, the decision to get out was very bittersweet because I never stopped loving the Marine Corps. Mm-hmm. A, lot of, a lot of people get out because they're disheartened or disgruntled, um, but like that was, I, I felt like I was ready to get out. Mm-hmm. Um, I did not get the deployment opportunities that I really wanted, mm-hmm. and I wasn't going to. Okay. Um, and there's a And I, I saw the next base I was going to would have advanced my career, but it wouldn't have advanced my, um, like, just like my goals. Yeah, your, your personal agenda. I mean, yeah. where you wanted to go. So, so where do they, where do they want to send you next? They wanted to send me to a recruiting station to be a public affairs um, okay. representative for an entire region of recruiting, which would have been awesome for my career. Mm-hmm. Um, as a marine, though, I, I. I wanted to lead junior Marines. I wanted to deploy and I wanted to do what I signed up to do. And I, that wasn't it. So, um, I just, I, I applied for some things to do. I, I didn't really get them. And the decision to get out was very like personal, like, okay, I'm ready to go to college. Like I'm ready to start a new path. And, um, I think it's important. And any advice I give Marines that are getting out is make sure you're ready. Mm-hmm. Because even now, um, I don't regret the decision to get out. I miss it, mm-hmm. but I don't regret the decision to get out. But I encounter a lot of veterans who are like, "I want back in," and mm-hmm. like, you got to be ready to get out. Um, if you're not ready, you're gonna like, "What if I would have stayed in?" Mentality would tear you up. So, mm-hmm. all right. Uh, so when did you get out? I got out um, the day after our Marine Corps ball in 2016. Um, so it was kind of like the best like going away party mm-hmm. I can think for myself. <laughs> Um, yeah, so. Okay. Uh, and now you're back and you're a student at Grand Valley State University. Uh, what are you majoring in? I'm uh, majoring in PR and advertising okay. with an emphasis in PR with a minor in photography. And I am learning so much. Like, it was fun doing photography in the Marine Corps. I learned a lot there. But the technical skills were not taught to me mm-hmm. the way they should have. And I'm just enjoying learning how to do studio photography and abstract photography and storytelling photography on a level that I've never done before. Okay. Now, do you find that your background helps you or you know things that some of the other traditional students don't know? 100%. The military has 100% prepared me to set me up for success in the civilian world, at least in the college environment. Um, And I have no doubt in the professional world as well. They just, 
it taught me I didn't have discipline getting into the military mm-hmm. I have discipline now <laughs> and I didn't have as much confidence going in as I do now um, now confidence isn't like I'm not cocky I'm still humble I've come from humble beginnings and like that's where I'm I, I know where I come from but there is a level of like I got this yeah. and uh, um, challenge accepted type mentality that I didn't really have before other than to take on the challenge of being a marine so okay well you effectively answered the usual final question of an interview like this which is how do you think your, your time in the service affected you because uh, I think you just told me mm-hmm. uh, now are there is there anything else that you recall that you, you, you want to put on the record here before we close this uh, interview out or any else things that kind of stands with you in your mind that if you think back to being in the Marines. Mm-hmm. I, I definitely grew a lot as a person. Um, there were some dark times and there were some like, really motivating times. Um, I, I, I was not like the perfect poster child of being a Marine, but I did my best. Mm-hmm. And I think that the, po- the concept of a poster child is not an accurate one because we all come from different walks mm-hmm. of life. Um, I'm grateful and I have nothing but good things to say about it. Even though the challenges, even with sexism and stuff, that's not the Marine Corps' fault. That's a human error. Um, and a lot of women, unfortunately, get like really disgruntled towards that attitude and disheartened. And um, you just get exhausted after fighting a stereotype for so long, and you still can't win because it's a cultural mentality. Mm-hmm. It's not. Um, it's not like an individual person you can. Yeah. to have a discussion with. Did that evolve at all over time? I mean, or was you just by changing stations, you have a different environment? No, it never evolved. It never mm-hmm. changed. And the, the worse I got, the more rank I picked up. Um, and, I mean, I, I ran into some really good leadership and really bad leadership. Mm-hmm. Um, and the really good leadership encouraged me and mentored me in a way I, I clung to that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess that would be like advice to anyone I would give is to cling to the ones you want to be like. Yeah. Um, and learn, learn, continue to learn from the ones that you don't want to be like. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it. A lot of females had it worse off than I did because um, I'm a very a flexible personality. I, I. Um, I try to understand where people are coming from, even though they say messed up things. I try to um, have discussions with people, um, mm-hmm. and I wasn't like. I was, I'm very slow to anger, so, like, a lot of women um, really struggled with um, getting, like, taking it so personally and so angry and instead of, like, letting it roll off. Mm-hmm. Gotta get some thick skin, and sometimes I think thicker skin than some of the guys. Um, I mean, they have their own battles, too. They have to fight oh, the whole Marine mentality, like, you have to be a, the ca- Captain America, yeah. and if you're not, then you're not really a good Marine, and, like, that's just a stereotype they have to face. So we each have our own struggles. Um, but I think the most important thing is to respect each other's struggles. And that's what a lot of, I found, male Marines lacked, was the respect for the struggle of fighting that stereotype instead of just assuming, if that makes sense, sure assuming that we're part of it. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's a really sophisticated view of the whole thing, really. And um, I'd you know, just like to close out here by but thank you. Thank you for taking the time to share the story today. Uh, you really told us quite a bit. I appreciate you having me. Okay. Thank you.